It's a great privilege to uh, be a part of the Dean Bergon Society, a society that's uh, 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 only uh, a reason for existence is to uh, preserve the, the text that uh, has given us the uh, uh, Bible that we hold in our hand that we uh, believe is the Word of God. And uh, tonight's a great honor to present Dr. Wade, who's going to uh, take a few minutes and uh, uh, present the uh, Dean Bergon Society. And I might say that uh, uh, if you haven't been aware of it, why... Uh, you're, uh, you're welcome to look over the uh, bylaws and all and uh, become a member of that uh, society. Dr. Wade will uh, maybe say something I'd like about to ask the men who are on the executive committee, the new ones and the old ones that we just recently elected, uh, to say just a few words. We want to limit it, if we can, to a, a minute, maybe a minute and a half. But, brethren, I'd like you to tell us what was the most important thing that changed your mind to come into the realization of the superiority of our King James Version. What won the most important yes, sir, we hope to publish. Yes, sir. That's something new that we started, and uh, some of us, and we want to try to republish some books that may have been lost to the readership that ought to get the reading. And one of the things that we have got possession of is, uh, is the copyright. I, I now own the co personally own the copyright of Doctor of Mr. Fowler's book, that one that's got all the columns in it that everybody says the best thing, and I say it's the best thing. I edited that book. I helped Mr. Fowler uh, put it into shape. I edited it with the assistance of one of my graduate students when I was in Maranatha's graduate department. I tell you a word about Brother Fowler. You read all about him in there, but. There's something that it, it doesn't say, and I know it. When I was a, a youngster in Christ, I suppose I was about 17, maybe 18 years of age, and I had entered the National Bible Institute in New York City. I'm a New Yorker. I'm right from Manhattan Island. And uh, I entered that school after I got out of high school. Uh, night school it was, and I was studying at what's now the state university, the city university rather, in New York, I got an assignment. The first assignment I got in evangelism was to go out into the highways and the hedges and hold an open air meeting. And we were allowed to have two other students in the class join us. We couldn't have more than three, but three of us could go and hold an open air meeting. I thought, what in the world was an open air meeting? So uh, I went out into the open air, and I was striding down Broadway on a Monday evening, and I came to 79th Street, the corner of 79th and Broadway. It's where the First Baptist Church is. And if you're in New York City anytime you want to go to a good church, it's still a good church. They don't have a great big crowd like they used to have, but they still preach the old-time faith. And uh, it's, in the, it's in the GRBC, by the way. Uh, I, I praise the Lord for that witness on Broadway. Well, what do you know? Here's a fellow standing out in the street away from the curbstone, protected by the back of a parked car, and he's out there spreading his hands, and he's trying to start an open air meter. And he, he was older than I, and I thought, well, I'll stop right here. I'll get my first lessons. <laughs> I decided to stop, and uh, he developed a meeting. He, he used a little help from me because he didn't have anybody to play an instrument, and I played a little bit. And, uh, and uh, uh, there was a lady standing in the crowd who was the sister of my piano teacher. And they were so narrow-minded in those days they wouldn't even let a woman play an instrument. That's how that's how old national, old-fashioned Baptists they were. You see, a woman couldn't talk. She couldn't even play. And that woman could play, but she was the sister of my piano teacher, but they, she couldn't. But I was male, so I couldn't. She said to the fellow, why don't you ask him? He's from the Baptist church up here, and he can play. And so I played. And I found out afterwards the fellow running the meeting was a fellow by the name of Fowler. In those days, he was a machinist. Uh, he had his college credentials as a, an engineer, and uh, so later he was in engineering, but he, he was, in those days he was a machinist. And that's the fellow who wrote that book. And that fellow began teaching me things, you see, a long, long time ago. That's something that you wouldn't hear except by personal experience. I, I saw that these things are important by uh, a 
I'll give you a text. I think it's a good text to, to tie this to, and instead of talking a lot about myself, right in the beginning of the Bible, we have the devil coming to humanity, and he says, Hath God said, and that's as far as you need to go. You make sure God said it. Make sure God said it. And if God said it, you make sure you find out about it. The only way you can be sure of that is if you read the King James, because some of the things that God has said may be missing from the other one that you might read. But here, it will be included. Hath God said? And listen, if we pay attention to what God has said, we're going to steer clear of an awful lot of trouble. I'm afraid that the curse is on even fundamentalism now because we have, as fundamentalists, been ignoring too much of what God has said. I better sit down before I preach. Oh, but I know that Faith Baptist Church fairly says, what's the one most important thing that changed you into the uh, fellowship of the King James Version? Well, I was 22 years of age, and I, too, was on Broadway, only not the one in New York City. I was on the Broadway that leaded to destruction. And I heard the Word of God, the King James Version of the Bible, preached by Oliver B. Green in a tent meeting. And I got born again. And it was because of Oliver Green that I began to question this issue. I had gone to Baptist Bible College in Johnson City, New York. That time it was called uh, Baptist Bible Seminary, and now it's in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. And uh, there they taught me the wrong view. They taught me the Westcott and Mark view, and uh, I had kind of swallowed that, but I heard Oliver Green on the radio saying that uh, he would not even accept the new Schofield Reference Bible, and I couldn't figure that out. I thought, man, what could be wrong with that? That's just a, the KJV updated and so forth, and so I wrote him a letter. He said, I've got enough old Schofield Reference Bibles to last me till I die, and I said, well, that's a strange thing to say. He's going to have to explain that to me. I wrote him a letter, and he wrote back, and he did explain some things, what, some things that were wrong with the New Scofield Reference Bible. And he said, it is not really the King James Version of the Bible. And I, man, I, that really floored me. I said, i got to look into this a little further. And that began my quest uh, that brought me to this place, and a long period of time, several years before I changed my view on this thing, until I was solid, had done the careful research and study that's required uh, to help you to understand the issue. And I just hope and pray that somebody here, that tonight may be the night that you will start on that quest. And I trust and pray that one of these days you'll be able to be up here on this end, holding this book in your hand, saying, I know and I believe without any, any shadow of a doubt that this is the Word of God. Thank you. Pastor Bob Stewart of this church, First Baptist Church, Harrison, Michigan. What's the thing that convinced you more than anything else? The superiority that came to birth. <laughs> Uh, after messing around with a few versions for some time back in the early 70s, uh, realizing that you didn't need to have a brand new version every four or five years, uh, I came to the simple conclusion that there was something wrong there and uh, got hold of Dr. Fuller's Witch Bible, uh, read it through, uh, was mostly convinced even before I read it, and that settled it once and for all for me, and I thank God for it. Dr. Grello, you told us this morning what led you to accept the spirit of the King James Version, but some people weren't here this morning, so just uh, succinctly repeat it, if you would, please. I have a background in that I attended and graduated from Wheaton College with a major in Greek, and then from Wheaton Graduate School later on, and I was taught without any doubt the superiority of the Westcott Hort textual position. I did not realize that there was any other position until some years later I saw an article in Bibliotheca Sacra, which is the publication of the Dallas Theological Seminary, but I didn't understand it. And I dismissed it. Never forgot it, but I didn't understand it. And it wasn't until the late 1970s, that would be, I graduated from college in 1964, so I had been in the ministry, and I had earned one doctorate by the time 1978 rolled around. And I 